So we'll get started. Um, today, we're talking about polar coordinates, to start with at least. So um, you guys know Cartesian coordinates, right? We kind of take them for granted, don't we? And um, so Cartesian coordinates, those are x, y coordinates. So, you know, it. so if we have, you know, we set up an x, well, that's not usually x, right? We set up an x coordinate and a y coordinate, right? And if you pick a point in the plane, you can identify it with a pair, right? Um, x comma y, right? And these are Cartesian coordinates in two dimensions. And we've been doing this since the time of, well, Descartes. That's why they're Cartesian coordinates. So I think Rene Descartes. And that, that was actually a really big deal, this idea that you can associate points with pairs of numbers, right? Because before that point, okay, um, I mean, I think this idea has been floated about since time immemorial, but, you know, there was sort of another world where you can talk about geomet geometric things sort of synthetically, like Euclid's geometry. It's not so, uh, I mean, the, Euclid will use numbers and things, but not universally so. And there's also sort of an attempt to not use numbers and use like constructive methods in Euclidean geometry. If you had high school geometry, there's large parts of it where you're not allowed to use a ruler, you know, because using a ruler is attaching a number to the distance between points and it's kind of sort of a, a backdoor towards, well, Cartesian geometry, Cartesian coordinates. Um, but anyway, so we we've take Cartesian coordinates for granted, but there's also another coordinate system uh, we call polar coordinates. So what are polar coordinates? Polar coordinates are basically defined by the following formulas. X equals to R cosine theta. Y is equal to R sine theta. And so like if you pick a point, I'll start with the kind of most natural one. Pick this point, X comma Y, right? And you can draw the line from the origin out to there, right? And the length of that line is R, right? And this angle here, the standard angle is theta, right? And if you look at X and Y, and we're in quadrant one to start with, right? So in quadrant one, you have this right here is R cosine theta, right? R cosine theta right there, right? And um, going vertically, the opposite of theta, right? This guy right here, that's R sine theta. So you see where these formulas come from, right? X is R cosine theta, Y is R sine theta. So I'm just talking about right triangle trigonometry in quadrant one. But the cool thing is, the way we've defined sine and cosine, these formulas equally, equally well extend to the other quadrants. So like if you, you know, what, we, what do we have over here? We've got cosine theta less than zero, sine theta greater than zero, right? Down here, we've got cos cosine theta less than zero, sine theta less than zero in quadrant uh, three, right? Quadrant four, we've got cosine theta positive and sine theta what? Negative. So, so here, um, I'm gonna say where just as a starting point, zero is less than or equal to theta, is less than, well, let's say less than two pi to start with, and r is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared, right? Now, I, I say that to start with because people do relax that, and they allow the standard angle to be identified with any set of, like, two pi length angles, because, you know, you can, you can choose another set of angles which are coterminal with these and you get the same description, right? Or you could, you can kind of, instead of this, you could do something like, you know, minus pi, less than theta, less than or equal to pi. You could do something like that. That's another choice. There are infinitely many choices for how you like choose the theta range. And in practice, we allow ourselves to exploit that coterminality. Like, 
you can identify pi over 4 with pi over 4 plus 2 pi, that degeneracy is part of, this, the, part of the standard game with polar coordinates, right? And so already there, there's a really big difference between Cartesian coordinates and polar coordinates, because in Cartesian coordinates, you tell me 2 comma 3. Unless you're confused about the 2 being x and the 3 being y, there's pretty much no way to mess that up, right? In polar coordinates, um, you say, I've got radius 3 uh, angle you know, 30 degrees, your friend says, well, I've got, you know, radius 3, angle 390 degrees, right? Different angles, but same geometric description. So that, that's something we have to deal with, all right? That's there. And the other thing that's annoying is sometimes people um, allow the radius to be negative, especially in, for the purposes of graphing with polar coordinates. So you got to, you just have to deal with that. The person you're talking to, are they allowing the radius to be positive and negative, because if they are, that changes the, the game a bit. Um, okay, anyway, so but what I want to point out to you, just as a starting point, is that the plus and minusness, if you will, of sine and cosine, it matches exactly what you want for x and y. See that? Both positive, x is positive, y is, excuse me, x is negative, y is positive, they're both negative, and over down here, the x is positive, the y is negative, right? So we have defined sine and cosine, right, for any real angle in such a way that these polar coordinates are well defined, right? In fact, I would say that's, to my taste, that's really why we defined sine and cosine as we did, <laughs> truth be told. But anyway, now, um, so um, just you know, as I've warned you, um, polar coordinates, there's a certain ambiguities that are involved. Um, another, another caution. So it makes sense to say that this point out here with, say, r and theta, um, well, let's see here. That's not how I want to say it. Let me stop that. Actually, let me, let me cease and desist from my current line of discussion until we've done a bunch of examples. <clears throat> I have this bad habit of talking about the weird part first. Let me, let me not engage in that at the moment. So, okay, so here's an example. Um, let us consider the point uh, 2 comma 3, find the polar coordinates. All right, so r, square root of 2 squared plus 3 squared, right? And so that's the square root of uh, 13. And how about the angle? Okay, we're in quadrant one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, inverse tangent, or arc tangent, some people call it, of y over x, right? Fifty-six point three one degrees, approximately. Good. Yeah, I. And, and so again, we also face an ambiguity. Do we want to use radian measure or degree measure, right? Unless I say otherwise, I take both as answers. If you look at my answer key, I will typically write both down because I don't want to take off points and I don't want to. Well, anyway, I, I try to do both. But um, if I was going to make my life easier, I really should pick one for your for your problems. Um, of course, we can convert that to radians. So, and whenever I do inverse tangent without like you know, further discussion, I always ask myself the question, okay, does this make sense? Well, 2, 3 is in quadrant 1, so we should have an angle between 0 and 90 degrees, right? This makes sense. Good. Um, okay, so notice, so a couple things. Um, from these, one of the things we can get from this is that, um, you know, did I do it backwards? I don't think so. So y over x, right, is r sine theta over r cosine theta, which exactly, which is tangent theta. So this tells us that oh, the r's cancel. 
So we have this, and we also have that um, tangent theta is equal to y over x for what? For x not equal to 0, right? Um, so polar coordinates are also a little bit funny. Like, you asked me what the Cartesian coordinates are of the origin. I can tell you, 0, 0. What are the polar coordinates of the origin? Well, it's definitely where the radius is 0. I think everyone agrees on that. But what's the angle of the origin? No, no one agrees on this. It could be anything. So we say that the angle theta is undefined at the origin. So if you really want to be fussy, polar coordinates aren't really a coordinate system on the entire plane. They're like a coordinate system on like the punctured plane. And even so, you have to delete a, um, you have to delete a ray somewhere. Otherwise, you don't get a one-to-one -one correspondence between um, radii and angles. And like the fussier definition of coordinate system is it's a one-to-one -one correspondence between some set and like some open set of either R2 or R3. So R3 is like R cross R cross R. So in the same way we make a, an identification of two-dimensional objects with like R cross R, R2, the Cartesian plane, you can make a one-to-one -one correspondence with three-dimensional R cross R cross R, R3 with three-dimensional space. We spend most of Calc 3 talking about the geometry of that. I'll do a little bit of that in here just to get you started when we talk about vectors at the end of the course. Um, but anyway, my point is, technically speaking, polar coordinates aren't a coordinate system because they don't have this one-to-one -one correspondence because of that angle degeneracy. Like, that's essentially the problem. So, but anyway, no one worries about this. We still call them polar coordinates. Don't worry about what I'm saying. So, um, I'm just making a comment. Example two. What if we find polar coordinates of um, the point, let's say minus one, well, let's say minus two comma two. All right. So this is this is in quadrant one, uh, quadrant what <laughs> rather, quadrant two, right? So notice that inverse tangent of 2 over minus 2 is inverse tangent of minus 1, which, by the way, is minus 45 degrees, right? Now, that is, the, that is not the correct angle for this one, right? Because in quadrant 2, where this thing is, right, we're over here. So we just found this angle down here, right? So how do we get the angle we're supposed to get? We want this one, right? That's theta, measured counterclockwise off the positive x-axis. So we got choices. What I suggest we do is say, just it's geometrically clear that this is 180 degrees minus 45 degrees. See, because this, this right over here is 180, right? So we're, we're 45 less than that. Right. Now the other way we can do these kind of problems is to ignore the signs, SIGNs, and just find the reference angle and then work off the axis where we're, we're closest to. Right. You got choices. Mm -hmm. Right. In quadrants, you know, so this goes back to that discussion we had about finding standard angles. We're actually finding, that was a polar coordinate example, truth be told. Um, I just wasn't talking about radius at that point. But those six examples I gave in that earlier lecture. Um, so in quadrants one and four, inverse tangent works. But in quadrants two and three, you've got to think through it. The inverse tangent doesn't give you, the inverse tangent lies. It lies. What's that? Oh, I thought you said the jab, but okay. I hear what I want to. Okay, anyway, so, um, oh no, my YouTube channel is going to get canceled. Ah. Um, I think it's sufficiently far into a trigonometry lecture. No one's going to notice. But um, let's see here. So anyway, what, what's the radius? I, I varied the, uh, the easy part. Square root of minus 2 squared plus 2 squared, right? And so that's 4 plus 4 square root of 8, right? So polar coordinates. Uh, 
um, r equals the square root of 8, theta equals to 135 degrees. Go on. Um, for quadrant 3, you have to add 180. Because, so like, just to summarize what's going on, if you're in quadrant 4, or rather if you're in quadrant 2, right, then you get this false angle, right? But if you're... <laughs> If you're in quadrant over here, it actually projects you up to this false angle. So like, for example, what we just did, I'll do another one. Well, let me just stick with the one we just did. Yeah, so we're at minus 2, 2. You know, it gave us inverse tangent. Uh, yeah, 2 over minus 2 equals minus 45 degrees, right? That puts us down here. On the other hand, if we had one over here, we had like, you know, well, let's say minus 2, minus 2, just to be boring. Then you get inverse tangent of minus 2 over minus 2, which is inverse tangent of, <laughs> listen to me, 45, of 1. The minuses cancel, and you get 45 degrees. So you, it, it, the inverse tangent lies to you for these kind of points. It gives you angles up here. So to correct that, you have to basically take and add 180. In that case, in this case, you, well, I guess you still add 180, don't you? <laughs> you can add or subtract 180. It'll just put you, it may put you with a theta that you don't want. So if you subtract 180 and you don't like the number that you get, you may still have to use like coterminality, if, I, and I'm, allowed, if I'm allowed to use that as a phrase, um, <laughs> to, to put the angle back into the multiple, like the range of 0 to 360 that you want, whatever. Um, Well, yeah, I mean, I'm sure, yes, I, I think looking at it is key. You must check your answer. Don't rely on a formula. Rely on pictures. Double check your work. I cannot emphasize that enough. All right, so enough of this. All right, let's work, the, let's work an example the other way. Well, that's what I was about to say, is there exist calculators that you can give a pair of points and they'll give you the polar coordinates, I'm sure, right? If you have a programmable calculator, you could easily make this an algorithm. Remember I gave that handout with a tan 2? Like, I gave a handout. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So on that, it actually has, like, a case-wise, you could easily turn that into an algorithm for a programmable calculator that would spit out the standard angle and the radius for, you know, Cartesian coordinates. Um, anyway, so what if, if the radius is 10 and the standard angle is, I don't know, 100 and, um, <coughs> sorry, 210 degrees, find the Cartesian coordinates, right? To find the Cartesian coordinates, we do 10 times the cosine of 210 degrees and 10 times the sine of 210 degrees. So, you know, I think you're right. right. So, we could say minus 5 root 3, which of course is approximately 8.66. And this one would be, yeah, just minus 5. Is that right? 210. Yeah, we're, we're both negative, right? We're in quadrant 3. So, oh, then the minus 5 is well approximated by minus 5, isn't it? So, okay. <laughs> there you go. All right. Are we good on this? Okay, so um, the other thing you want to think about with polar coordinates is at least a little bit, is what, what do formulas, like we, we have a certain set of um, things we know how to graph in Cartesian coordinates, right? 
So we can ask the question, how do graphs transform? You know? And by the way, guys, if um, those of you who are not here and you come back later and you want to see more on how to calculate standard angles, like we can do more of these. You just have to ask. I'm just bored with them for today to do more. All right? We did do six of these before, you know, but you can't, you, you, you I, I did, okay, so I've done about nine of them, ten of them in class maybe, right? You need to do about a hundred, <laughs> all right, probably. It is one of the most important skills to gain from this class, and, and you do need it for physics, right? Because to calculate the, the direction of a vector, it's like the standard angle calculation often. But let's talk about graphs. Cartesian versus polar. All right, so here's one. X squared plus Y squared equals to, I don't know, nine. So in this, this is a unit circle, right? Where the radius is what? Did I say unit circle? I said, I, I meant to say circle centered at the origin. It's not a unit circle. Its radius is not nine, nope. Put, put, like, so to figure it out, put x equal to zero. What happens? You have y squared equals to nine, so y is plus or minus three, right? So these points, that's like zero, three, zero, minus three, three, zero, and minus three, zero. So those are, you know, three, four points on this circle. Anyway, the point is, the radius of the circle is, is, is three. So in polar coordinates, you could write this as r squared equals to nine. Like, just, that is a literal, since remember, let me, let me put it over here. Let's keep this in mind. We have x squared plus y squared equals to r squared, that's true. And we have x is r cosine theta, we have y is r sine theta. And it's also useful to remember that the tangent of theta is y over x, for x not equal to zero. So these, these are kind of like our fundamental tools for converting to and from polars to um, Cartesian coordinates for thinking about, you know, modifying equations. So first of all, and, and r squared equals to nine, well, we can, we can do a little bit better than that, right? We can just say, well, this is really r equals to three. This is the polar equation of a circle, the radius three centered at the origin. Which is simpler, this or this? I think it's pretty clear that the radius three one is simpler, right? It, it really elegantly describes what a circle is. How about this? Y equals mx plus b. This is a what? Slope, slope m line with y intercept b. What's the polar, what's the polar equation of a line? So to do that, you just take y and you replace it with r sine theta, very simple, and you replace x with r cosine theta. Now right there, that's the equation of a line in polar coordinates, but we can do a little bit better. Customarily, we solve for r as a function of theta, just like we solve for y as a function of x in the usual way, right? So solve for r is the custom. And that gives us r is equal to, I'll do, the, I'll do the, uh, the algebra here, b divided by sine theta minus m cosine theta. That is the equation of a line of slope m with y-intercept b in polar coordinates. It's also hideous. Right? This is obviously not the right way to treat a line. Why? Because lines through the, you know, lines with slope, y-intercept, these are the natural objects of Cartesian 
coordinate geometry. This doesn't really belong, all right, in uh, polar coordinates. I mean, it's not it's not best. Yeah. So the next step was r sine theta minus m r cosine theta equals to b. And then I factored the r out. And then I divided by that, both sides, to get that. Yeah. Yeah, and sorry, I just ran out of chalkboard. Um, let's see here, another example. Uh, let's see here. One I like, and this is this is kind of going a different way. Um, how can I say? How about this? Uh, x square x um, x minus one squared plus y squared equals to one. That's a pretty nice example. This is a circle, right? Radius one, that's not centered at the origin. So this is actually a circle which is centered at 1, 0 as radius 1. So it looks something like this. All right? That's what this, this, what this, that's what this graph is, right? So what's the, polar, what's the polar equation for this? Well, again, we can just play the game where we substitute in um, our cosine theta minus 1 squared plus r sine theta squared equals to 1, right? And then we can say, okay, well, what is that? How does that, does that simplify? It actually just simplifies quite a bit. Let me show you. So this gives me r squared cosine squared theta minus 2 r cosine theta plus 1 equal up uh, plus r squared sine squared theta equals to 1. A lot of stuff cancels here. The ones on both sides cancel. We can combine the r cosine squared term and the other r sine squared term to give us just r squared times cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta, right? Again, the ones cancel, and that's equal to 2r. I'll, I'll just move the 2r cosine theta to the other side, if you don't mind. Yeah. But of course, r squared plus cosine squared theta is, is 1, right? This is just numero uno. And what do we have? Well, it looks like we've got r is equal to 2 um, did I drop a oh, r is equal to I'm sorry, r is equal to 2 cosine theta, yeah. I divided both sides by r, which is a little sketchy if r is equal to 0, right? And is that irrelevant? Well, not really. 0 is on this thing. But but uh, you know, you're like, well, that doesn't make sense. When the, what, about the or, what about the origin? What about the origin? That's the kind of thing people are willing to look aside in this whole discussion. It's a little bit sloppy. It's just a little bit sloppy. In, in its practice, as it's practiced by engineers and people who do these things. But um, now the question is, does that make sense? How does that work, this equation? How does that give you the circle? Well, let's think through it. What happens when theta equals to 0? Theta equals to 0. Let me make a little table of values here. Theta, 2 cosine theta, right? 0 gives me 2. How about um, 45 degrees? So that's like 0 0.7, <clears throat> so that's 1.4. For what? Okay, and uh, 90 degrees? Zero. zero, right. How about um, 30 degrees? How about um, Let's try like uh, minus 45. 
Oh yeah, so it's, it's symmetric, right? So like, um, you know, minus 60 degrees is uh, one, right? Okay, so like, see what's going on here. So at zero degrees, we're at two, right? When we're at 90 degrees, we're at zero. You had to think about it in a limiting sense, all right? Um, when you're at like 80 degrees, you're like here. At 45 degrees, you're here. At, you know, 30 degrees, you're out here. Um, let's see here. At 60 degrees, well, I'm, I'm not doing it quite right. At 60 degrees, you're like here-ish. I don't know, I can't, I can't graph it quite good, but if you just trace it out, you'll see that you're, you're filling the circle out as you let the theta go from 0 to 2 pi. So it becomes an interesting question then, right? What if we just look at graphing in polar coordinates? How does that work, right? So that, that's the question that we kind of find ourselves with as we're, as we're looking at things. So the, the, the problem of converting a Cartesian equation to its corresponding polar equation, it's actually pretty cut and dried. There's not much to do. All you got to do is everywhere there's an x, what do you do? You replace the x with r cosine theta. Every place there's a y, you put r sine theta. And then you just face the music, algebraically speaking, right? Hopefully stuff simplifies, whatever. But it's a much more interesting question to ask the question if um, r is equal to some function of theta, right? Then what is that even? I mean, we're actually going to be able to come up with all kinds of like neat new examples. I'll do a really simple one. Um, how about this? Uh, oh, curses. Well, let me start with a non-example. Uh, how about theta equals to 45 degrees, right? That is this, right? The origin's not in there, technically speaking, right? And it goes on and on, right? This, this, is, this is a ray. And by the way, that's exactly the thing that the question above is not. Because the question above says you've got a function of theta, right? So let me give you an example with the, with the, the something like this. How about this? The simplest thing to do, how about r equals to theta? So take f of theta equals to theta, what's that look like? You know? So what, what I, you know, um, if you don't have technology to, in front of you to use, what you do is you just make, kind of just like follow around. Um, so here, let me, let me just make a picture for us. So we start at zero, right? Are you fixing my camera? Thanks. <laughs> so we, st we start at zero, right? What happens when we get to pi over two? By the way, we're always using radians when we're graphing. But pi over 2 is what? It's about 1.5. So for my scale, let me put that about right here. What happened at like pi over 4? It was at like 0.75, right? So that means it's doing something like that, right? What happens when it gets to pi? Well, when it gets to pi, the radius is about 3. So that's over here. So, so it went out to here somehow, right? When you get to r equals to, excuse me, theta equals to 3 pi over 2, we're about, you know, another, we're a little bit further out, right? When you get to 2 pi, you're to 6. Okay. 
Right, so what, what, what you got here, if I could draw it, is, is a spiral. R equals to theta is a spiral. All right. And um, if you allow theta to be negative, right, then the, see, that's the thing is people will allow theta to be negative. What do they mean by that? So here's the custom. <laughs> Um, minus r and theta is identified with r and theta plus pi. So for example, if I have radius equals to say minus 10 and theta equals to say 30 degrees, right, then this is identified with radius equals to 10 and theta equals to 210 degrees. This makes sense because if you plug in a negative radius into the formulas for polar coordinates, you, you get the same thing out. Let me just draw it like geometrically what's going on. So what we're saying is that, all right, so we're, we're at this point, 210 is down here, right? Radius 10 is down here somewhere, right? We're saying this point, you can either write it as 10 cosine of 210 degrees, comma 10, sine of 210 degrees. Or you can write that as minus 10, cosine of 30 degrees, minus 10, sine of 30 degrees. You try it out. They both give you the same numbers. Because of the way cosine works, you know? Cosine's negative for 210. Um, but you put the minus in by hand here. So this point has two sets of polar coordinates. So you can either say that this point has polar coordinates r equals 10 and theta equals 210, right? Or you can say it has r equals to minus 10 with 30 degrees. It's really weird, but people do this, okay? And so I'm obligated to talk about it at least a little bit. Now I have. There will be some homeworks on the, uh, the, the odd convention, all right? So, um, so hopefully I can get this projector working because as much fun as it is to do this stuff by hand, it is so much more interesting to look at it um, with, a, yeah, with a Desmos because Desmos will do polar graphing and it's like you don't have to work hard at either. If you just put in like, um, you know, let's see if I can get it going. So you are, you are going to be here Wednesday, right? That's the plan? You'll be here Wednesday? That's good, because like Wednesday, we're going to cover uh, complex numbers. Uh, not yet, no. So check it out. Like it already, all I had to do was type in theta. It changed it to a theta. And there, there's what, I mean, there's a better picture of what I was trying to do. And you can see what happens if you throw in negative theta. Check it out. Here's minus 2 pi to 2 pi. Come on. So the, the one we were graphing is this guy, right? And here's what happens with the minus. It ends up doing that, yeah. Here, let's try. Let's try A cosine B theta. All right, so we start out with both of them being one, and we have a circle, right? So if I increase this to, uh, you know, whatever, I increase the radius of the circle, right? We had radius two. No, we had, we had the two here, so we had a radius one circle, right? That was our example I worked out by hand a minute ago. What happens when we change B? Yes, you can make a flower. What we're looking at right now 
let's see here, let me, let me make it a little bit more, uh, let me make it 3, so there's b equals to 3, and um, I'll make it a little bit bigger. This is essentially, a is essentially the radius of the thing. I'll make it 6 so we can see it nice and big. I'll make it 7, there we go. Ah, don't do that. 10's good, all right. So if, so what we're looking at is the picture of r equals to um, 10 cosine of 3 theta. What do you think happens if I change the 3 to a 4? Do you think we'll get four petals? Let's find out. We don't get four petals, we get eight. Interesting, isn't that? What, hap what happens if we get to five? Nope, you get five. It behaves different for even and odd. So for odd, if you put an odd number of theta in there, you get the same number of petals. If you put even, you get doubling. What happens if instead of doing cosine, we do sine? So sine, it looks like sine of five theta is still giving us five petals. What happens if we do four petals? If I can get the four, eight again, huh? So it seems like the even even arguments do, do funky stuff. Um, but you you know um, you can try weirder stuff, you know. Like, I don't know, um, theta squared um, minus theta. What's that even? I don't know. Apparently it's this. Um, and I could put a put my slider in there and then see how that changes. Animate it. These are all the different graphs that are possible from theta squared minus a theta. Uh, I, I think Desmos is one of the most underused tools by students. Like, if you really want to explore and see what's out there in terms of graphs, it's hard to beat this thing. Um, Wee! See, I'm trying to think of another good example. Oh, I know. Let's try. I'm probably going to mess this up, but 1 divided by 1 plus a theta. What's going to happen now? Whoa, what, 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 what happened? Just, what, was that, what was that little stuff in there? What's that? Tell you what we're going to do. Well, let's, change the, let's change this from like minus 1 to 1. Ah! Uh, maybe minus two to two, how about that? Sometimes one is special. And I'll make my step size 0 0.001. Hmm. What's going on in there? It looks like we're getting spirals again, huh? I'm not remembering this quite right. Just let me indulge me for a second here. Polar equation of ellipse. Yeah, 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 yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Give me the formula. Uh, e. Oh, I need an A upstairs too. That's what I'm missing. And on the cosine theta. Ah, that's what I'm forgetting. There's a cosine theta down here. So you guys, you guys know about um, ellipses and Cartesian coordinates? Yeah. So check this out. So A is what's called the, um, if I, I, I could add a B in here, um, so we can play around with that. But what we're looking at here is if the, excess, if the eccentricity of the ellipse is 1.07, it looks like this, right? What happens when the eccentricity is 1? It's no longer a hyperbola, right? It's actually, I said ellipse, but that was actually a hyperbola, wasn't it? Uh, and when, a, when the eccentricity is 1, it looks like we've got a, uh, um, a parabola, right? And when the eccentricity is less than 1, we're getting 
an ellipse. And I think when you get down to eccentricity zero, we can't see it because we're, we're way, way out there, you know. Come on. Man, it won't show up at all. So I think it may be a numerical defect, but eccentricity zero gives you a circle. So, you know, we've talked about, remember um, Kepler's laws talk about the, uh, you know, the planets orbiting the sun in elliptical orbits with various eccentricity? Well, that's this. Eccentricity zero is like a circle. Eccentricity one, parabola, beyond one, you get hyperbolic. So like hyperbolic orbits are not bound to the solar system, right? And um, these three different cases are all the same polar equation with just different choices of the parameter. In contrast, if you look at the Cartesian equations, you've got like x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals to one for the ellipse, or you put a minus in for the hyperbola, or you've just got, you know, like y equals x squared or something like that for the, um, for the parabola. These are what are called conic sections, right? But polar coordinates unifies these all in terms of like this one simple uh, parameterization of a conic section. And um, if you take a class in junior level mechanics, <coughs> which we do not offer, and um, <laughs> because we don't have a physics major, so like you could offer the class, but who would take it? No. Um, anyway, in that class, you'll, you can solve a particular uh, differential equation and like work that out. I've seen it worked out in about a week's worth of junior level physics class. And um, but anyway, uh, it's fun stuff. But next time, we'll get into uh, um, complex, uh, complex numbers, and I will show you how we can derive every trig identity we have seen this semester with algebra.